In this video, our main goal is to derive the equations of motion of the simple harmonic oscillator. Now we do have to guess the solutions of a differential equation in order to get this done. So we'll take a little bit of a mathematical sidetrack and talk about how you guess solutions to this kind of equation. Once we get the general solution for the differential equation, the frequency and period formulas for the harmonic oscillator immediately drop out of that solution. So we get those. And then we'll wrap things up with an example where we're able to find the equations of motion of a harmonic oscillator by applying a set of initial conditions to the general solution. In my picture, I'm looking at a harmonic oscillator, and right now the mass is located at a position of x. And that means the force on it, due to Hooke's law, is negative kx. And the sign on this is really important now because that means when x is positive, the force is negative. In other words, it points to the left. When x is negative, that force would be positive and point back to the right, and this is what causes the oscillations. And all I do is apply Newton's second law to this. So F net equals ma. All right, the only force being felt here is negative kx, and that's equal to ma. And when you first look at that, you may not realize you're looking at a differential equation, but a is the second time derivative of the position. Just to clean things up a little bit, so there's our second order differential equation that pops out of Newton's second law. And the goal here is to guess the function of time. So x is a function of time that when I differentiate it twice, I get back a minus sign and a k over m times the original function of time. So we're trying to work out a solution with kind of a guessing and adjusting approach. And the first thing I want to look at is this sign out in front. So I differentiate twice and I get back the original function with a minus sign out in front. And I'm trying to guess what sorts of functions behave this way. And after trying a few things, I realize that sines and cosines are a really good candidate here because if I differentiate them twice, let's look at the sine function. After one derivative, it becomes the cosine. After two derivatives, it becomes the negative of the original function. And the cosine has the same property. Differentiate twice, you end up with the negative of the original function. So sines and cosines are a really good candidate. Now, how do I deal with the k over m out in front? So that comes from the chain rule working on one of these functions. So let's look at one like this. I'll just write sine omega t. If I differentiate once, I get omega cosine omega t. The chain rule forces you to tack on the derivative of omega t with respect to t. Then I differentiate again, and I get negative omega squared sine omega t. Another factor of omega coming out from the chain rule. So I have a minus sign, and then the square of the coefficient of t tacked on out in front. So what sorts of x's satisfy this differential equation? Well, there's two different flavors, and one of them would be a cosine of a square root of k over m times t. When you differentiate that twice, you get your minus sign times the original function, and you get two factors of root k over m, which combine to give you k over m. The second flavor is the sine function. And I'm just going to verify one of these explicitly, and I'll leave the other one to you. If I take x1 prime of t, that gives me a negative because it's a cosine function, a square root of k over m out in front because of the chain rule, and the cosine differentiates to the sine. Then I take the second derivative. And another factor of root k over m comes out because of the chain rule. I multiply those two square roots and just get what's inside. And then the sine differentiates to the cosine. And so this is actually negative k over m multiplied by my original position as a function of time, cosine root k over m t, x1 of t. So I have a function of time that is satisfying this differential equation. The equation says differentiate twice and you get negative k over m out in front of what you started with. So we're good. So now I need to generalize a little bit. I could also multiply each of these by an arbitrary constant. And it would still satisfy the differential equation because you just get an arbitrary constant on each side of the differential equation. No problem. Again, I'll do one of these explicitly and leave the other one to you. So I take the first derivative, second derivative. And then I show that that's negative k over m times the original function. So just factoring those out in front, negative k over m times the original function. And I have a solution to the differential equation. All right, so there's a fact from differential equations that the general solution of a second order equation requires two arbitrary constants in it. And so to get my most general solution, 
I'm going to take a linear combination of these two flavors, my x1 and my x2, and I see that I have two arbitrary constants in that. Each of these pieces individually satisfies the original differential equation, but so does the linear combination of those pieces. And just because this video is getting pretty long, I'm going to leave that proof to you, but take the derivative of this whole thing twice, and then show that you get negative k over m out in front of this whole thing that we started with to prove that it satisfies our differential equation. Okay, that's our general solution for the simple harmonic oscillator. And this is a sum of two periodic functions that have the same period. And that means this solution is periodic. And if I write down the period of it, I have the period of oscillation for the harmonic oscillator. Period is just 2 pi divided by the coefficient of t. In other words, 2 pi times the reciprocal of root k over m. So 2 pi root m over k. Many of you have probably been using that formula for a while already, and now you know where it comes from. I can also write down frequency just as a reciprocal of that. So now that we've got the general solution, what are we supposed to do with it? There's two arbitrary constants in it, and how do I nail those down to find out exactly the position of this thing as a function of time? And the idea is to apply initial conditions to this in order to nail down specifically what the solution is. That's called a particular solution. Our typical initial conditions would be the initial position and the initial velocity. Given those two conditions, you'll be able to nail down the two arbitrary constants in the position function and write down exactly how this thing is moving for all moments in time. So here's an example where we're given some initial conditions to apply. So we want to find the position function given that the mass is 200 grams or 0.2 kilograms. Our spring constant is 9 newtons per meter. And my initial conditions are that it starts from rest, that means V of 0 equals 0, when the position is 0.15 meters or 15 centimeters. So my initial conditions look like this. X of 0 equals 0.15. V of 0, which is X prime, is equal to 0. So we start with the general solution of the harmonic oscillator. And I know x of 0 is 0.15. Well, when I evaluate x at t equals 0, the sine part is going to vanish because the sine of 0 is 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1. Uh, so all that survives here is c1, and I immediately have the number for c1. It's 0.15. Now I get ready to apply my second initial condition but I need an expression for v of t, so that's the first derivative of the position function. When I evaluate this at t equals 0, the sine part is going to vanish. The cosine part, that gives me 1, and I end up with root k over m, c2, is equal to 0, and that means c2 is equal to 0. So now I plug in these values of C1 and C2 back into the general solution, and I have an equation telling me exactly how this thing moves for all moments in time. I think before I plug in, I'm going to go ahead and get a number on root k over m, and I get about 6.71 for that. So my position function for this oscillator is C1, that's 0.15, and this one turns out to be a pure cosine function. This always happens when you start from rest. 6.71t. So now I can go to my graphing software, and that position function tells me precisely where this oscillator is for all moments in time in the future. If you find the physics content on Zach's Lab helpful, click on the Zach's Lab logo on the right to browse playlists and subscribe to the channel. I produce over 100 new videos per month, and subscribing is the easiest way to find new content. Thanks for watching.